I'm going to hit record and it's recording. So we're going to talk today about you and how you got started in ballet and dancing and teaching. Um, how, how did you first get interested in ballet? Was it something you wanted to do or your, your parents wanted you to do? And where did you start training? Um, so I grew up by trying basically uh, uh, different types of activities um, from basketball to hip hop to ballroom dancing, uh, singing, literally just as most of the kids do, right? Just, tr just trying everything. And when I did a ballroom dancing, we had um, uh, a warm up teacher who was actually a choreographer. So he spotted me, I was really small in height. Uh, so he put in me on the window <laughs> on this very, very wide um, uh, window. And he said, well, guys, if anybody doesn't know how to do things, just watch her. <laughs> so, so after that lesson, he did suggest to my mom to give me maybe to try to ballet because in ballroom I had no future. I, I was really very short and I didn't have a partner, so, um, but I had no idea what ballet is. So uh, we went to uh, an audition for a, it's called like a pre-ballet school, like a, a tryouts basically. And I was still too young because a ballet school takes from a grade five and I was uh, going to grade four. So then he, he suggested to not waste time and just maybe try gymnastics. I went to gymnastics, I lasted there probably a month. I hated it. Uh, so I ran away with big tears. And I said, uh, why don't we just go and see how ballet looks? Because I have no idea what school I'm, I'm trying to get in, right? So my mom uh, got us a ticket to go to National Ballet of Lithuania to see a Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. And uh, since then, throughout the whole summer and the next audition to actual ballet school, I kept on dancing Seven Dwarfs. The angry one, the funny one, the, you know, the sleepy one. Those were my characters for the rest of the time until I auditioned for the school. Uh, but even till then, I haven't really done ballet, but I really was drawn by how you can become someone on stage and that captivated me a lot. And I said, well, yeah, if, if I can be anyone I want on stage, yeah, I want to do ballet. <laughs> so that's how I got into the ballet school. I auditioned. Uh, I got accepted. Uh, during the audition, I still had no idea what the audition is. So I think most of the people know how the auditions in the Russian ballet school go. You know, you're undressed. They check your extensions and spine and everything and jump and flex it, everything. And at the end, they asked me to uh, dance onto music. And all the other kids, I mean, obviously, they went to um, uh, to a ballet kind of uh, probably uh, as a hobby. I had no idea. I just improvised hip hop dance and I sat on a split and I said, yo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got accepted anyway. <laughs> Everybody laughed. But I said, sorry, I don't know what ballet is and I don't know how to dance ballet, but I can dance hip hop. <laughs> so I improvised that. And that's when my journey started. Wow. Is that your little dog barking in the back? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bring him out. It's okay. Does he want to come out? Yes, sir. Come. Come. I'm on a balcony, so he just hears some sounds and he barks. That's it. He's next to me, so okay. he won't bark anymore. That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. I, I love dogs. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to be a professional ballet dancer and that it would become your career? Um, well, the thing is, when you get to a professional ballet school, I, I didn't do any hobby a uh, ballet as a hobby right so when you enroll to that school it's very clear this is the path it's not for fun you're there to train to you know dedicate your time all day together with academics so at age nine i would say age nine uh and uh i also growing up in a very difficult family i 
I was given a choice to either go to a normal school like my sister did and just, you know, just do academics or because, uh, or to go to ballet school and live in a boarding school. And, but then I have to know that this is my path and, you know, so make a decision now, basically. So I did at nine years old. I said, yes, this is what I want to do, no matter how, what it's going to cost me. <laughs> um, yes. So it, it wasn't a gradual decision at all. I needed to make a choice, you know, whether I, I want this to be my profession. And what were some of the challenges you faced uh, you know, being in a boarding school and being away from your family and being so young? Um, it wasn't easy, especially at the beginning, uh, because, well, I was nine and I, mm -hmm. I went home approximately twice a year only, maybe for uh, autumn break and then uh, uh, Christmas break and then summer. So my ballet was really... Like my, I was living in a ballet world, right? So that was my life. And uh, the easy part was that everyone who is in that school or in the boarding school wants the same thing. So I think that really was uh, an challenge, but a good challenge and a good push that, look, I'm not the only one. There are other hundreds of people who want the same thing, right? So, so it, it created that drive never ending striving for perfection and things like that and trying to put aside whether i miss my family or i want to go home or not because we already knew back then if you miss two days and to go home was really far also so i couldn't even you know afford to go home but um you kind of i kind of knew already back then if if i'm gonna miss two three days just because I miss home or I'm homesick, I'll have to pay a big price for catching up because everybody is going to study really hard <laughs> and, and be ahead of me. So, uh, so it was a mental game with myself, but I think because I was so young, it was just all normal. Like I just accepted as this is the way it is and this is the way it should be. And I didn't know any other way. So, <laughs> so when you don't know any other way, you just get carried away the way you live and that's it. And uh, yeah, so I spent, uh, I did spend eight years in, in that school, in the National Valley School in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. Wow. What do you think the biggest factors are relating to success in the dance world? I mean, obviously for you, it was tremendous dedication um, and, and years of training, but, what do you think the, the factors for success are as a professional? Um, a, a little bit of everything, of course, because uh, I cannot say it's just hard work because it is hard work, but obviously even no matter what rank you achieve in your career, it's going to be always hard work. Either you are called a ballet soloist or or a principal, but a big role pays or, um, plays uh, as well, a little bit of luck, a little bit of in the right time, the right place, um, mm -hmm. um, being seen by the right people, uh, making the right choices. It's not, hard work is the key, but I cannot say that if you work hard, you will definitely achieve your best potential and you will definitely achieve your best self as a dancer. But also success means a different things to everybody, right? For some people, success is just to get in the company. For some people, success is to be a principal dancer. And for some people, even that is not enough. They wanna be internationally renowned dancers. They wanna travel, they wanna work with choreographers. They wanna, uh, you know, success is 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 not the same for everyone so we mm -hmm. I, I think talking on just on my it, from my experience i i did strive what i thought i can 
call a successful career and 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 it, it's never ending role road with every with every year those priorities change and evolve and and uh, and the goals are further and further and further when we're just about to reach them i just move them away to another goal <laughs> so, so it's never ending journey of self um, development and um, and and a work on 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 oneself actually so uh it's a little bit of everything to answer it, to your question of course were, were there ever times where you just thought maybe you shouldn't do this and you should have gone to academics instead of dancing did you ever want to give up or no you always uh y yes i did and uh but i don't think i'm the only one in the world <laughs> um we all have a meltdowns and we all have a uh a, a path in our lives where you know you hit the rock bottom and then you have to go up again but those thoughts were never as serious those thoughts were actually just to motivate myself more so you know you i, I would tell myself okay you know maybe i shouldn't just do it and you know it's it's not worth it and you know not good enough or 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 any sort of things that one says uh, on a bad day but then you sit down and you realize um well who am i without it and uh, this is part of my life and i then you realize that it's it's just a bump in the road right so you overcome it and most of the time every thought like this that brings you down would make me go further so at the end every overcome of a little bump would bump you further <laughs> further ahead but that's my experience i i never really um dived in into a negative thinking it's really uh, a one day or or, or or a time short period of time where you just think I'm done <laughs> but then you're like no I'm not done <laughs> I'm gonna fight <laughs> was there a, a teacher or a mentor that you had that made a difference in your dancing that really I think you I, I think because of my in very international career and a lot of traveling and every time when I guest and I go somewhere I meet new teachers all the time so even the new repetitors in another company or, or coaches of my partner who would coach me and uh, you know just belonging to four companies so far in in 15 years of my career um i i feel like i've met so many incredible teachers that each of them opened up something in me and that's what i call luck that's when a little bit of luck comes in with the hard work because I I dare to call myself a really hard worker and and I don't think anyone can <laughs> debate that um, but every time that new teacher would come in they would point me into the direction that oh why don't you try that and would open in me something completely new whether a new way of phrasing whether a new way of, of, of using my arms coordination footwork approaching the role um, actually questioning my interpretation and making me rethink the roles reread the books uh, because then I have to convince them why do I do it this way uh, so it opens up a really nice uh, a conversation between the mentor teacher and uh, and a dancer and a partner so uh i i would not be able to single out uh one but i could definitely name a few uh few coaches that made uh, a drastic change in in my dancing and and in my a, a, a approach to dancing um one of my first teachers in uh in munich ballet academy was constance vernon who opened up uh, you know, I came from Lithuania to to train for a year in in Munich Academy, and I wasn't even a professional back then. And throughout that year, my dancing changed. 
upside down. Mm. She introduced me to um, a French technique, chicory and phrasing and, and a different way of, of, of uh, being on stage without, because I come from Russian school, so I had the one approach of dancing and, and she came more from French school schooling. And she showed me another way of being on stage and presenting yourself. And then when I joined the company, one of my first coaches were Johanna Bjornsson. Uh, so I prepared with her all my leading performances, basically. And then when Natalia Makarova came to stage by there in Swan Lake, I worked mm. with her. Wow. I went to New York to work with her on Swan Lake, one-on-one, -on -one, just me and her in the studio, hours and hours because uh, I did not believe that I can do swallowing because on my, all my life I was told that I'm not going to do swallowing. And, and so Natasha, yeah, I, I mean, working with her, it op opened up that true deep belief that the height does not matter. It matters how you dance, your amplitude of movement, your, how you cover the stage, how you express yourself, how you use the body to tell the story. And then another one I would really singled out. It's 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 really one of the best coaches I've worked for a long time in my entire career. It's when I went to Dutch National Ballet uh, and I worked with Guillaume Grafan, who was a dancer with a Paris Opera and ABT and um, an amazing coach. And I call that my my golden years of always running to studio with a smile to work with him and when i would see him passing by at the end of the class i don't know i would just lighten up because i was so eager to every day to learn something from him every day he would surprise me with something new over the five years so that was truly the golden, golden five years where he shaped me as a principal, international principal ballerina that I started guesting a lot. I went throughout the whole world, um, galas, guest shows, um, full in ballets and everything. I worked with Guillaume, <laughs> you know. So, and then, as I said, I feel bad not mentioning <laughs> over everybody because it's not fair because, you know, it's... And, and Christian Machan and Yannick Pocan and uh, Loi Paraujo, who is absolutely uh, the, one of the best teachers known in, in uh, known as, as one of the absolutely best teacher, teachers in the world. And so really, I, I think in that sense, I was so lucky that every time I would feel like, oh, I'm not growing, I would meet someone my way who just like opened my eyes. Wow. Did you, did, with all of your dancing, do you have a favorite role? No. No. <laughs> no. And, uh, and recently I found this uh, uh, expression that seems to work. I tell people this. I say, can you have your favorite child? If you have three or four or five kids, no, they're all your favorite. Cool. So I approach, I approach the role as raising it from zero. I come into a studio like empty sheet of paper with no preconceptions, no assumings. I come in, I learn the steps, read the books, biographies, whatever I'm dancing to really dig, dig deep. Uh, and then I start molding it little by little and creating it and uh, changing it and questioning it. And so it's never, again, it's never ending process, but then it becomes mine. It, I feel like it becomes mine the way I see them. And then when the, and at that point it feels favorite and then the new one comes in and then the new one feels favorite and then it keeps on going like this over and over again. <laughs> oh my goodness. So are you teaching now? Are you, you are teaching now? Uh, during COVID it happened. Um, <laughs> life, you know, uh, that's life and when one door closes another one opens up and I did have my grieving period when the COVID started and you know it was really difficult to at the beginning I thought it's a month and then I, I thought it's just a few more weeks and then when I really understood that it's going to take a long time 
I, I dropped my grieving period and I said, I have to do something with this time. And uh, I started with Instagram live classes because I take my class all the time anyway. So I said, why, you know, people, you want to join my class? I'm doing Instagram live. My class that I do for myself every day, sometimes it's one hour, sometimes bar, sometimes I did two hour bar and some extra work. So I was just trying to keep in shape and find the ways to reinvent the bar work and point work that it would keep me strong, keep me in shape just from doing a bar because I did not have space at home to do anything more. I couldn't jump. I couldn't really turn. There was not enough space. So I had to in- reinvent what can I do with the bar. So after a few weeks of doing a bar like that, uh, I got a lot of followers. <laughs> And people started asking to explain things. How do we do this? How do we do that? I got a feedback that it, it, they don't have pain anymore in the back or hips or anything mm-hmm. or, or that they are so strong, that they're stronger than when they were working. And that was a huge compliment. I said, oh, I'm keeping you in shape. Cool. <laughs> and then one door after another door opened up and I got invitations to to teach uh, on worldwide ballet class and then Zoom came in, master classes, different summer intensives. So it kind of, as soon as I let it go of my need of closing down and training because it's a a short period of time, I thought, you know, just focus and train. And then I saw it leads nowhere. So when I opened up, everything else opened up to me as well. So now I have to say, with the private teachings and um, you know, and all the online platforms connecting with entire world because there are so many people joining classes. Uh, it feels amazing to be part of something bigger, of something new and contribute to actually to dancers well-being at this difficult time. Jeez. So yeah, I did not teach before. <laughs> So you teach now. Do you think online teaching is effective? Um, depends for whom. Uh, if it's an experienced dancer, that uh, many of us, we do join other teachers uh, online. We know what our bodies, we know how we we'll train. And it's great. The one thing that's why it's effective, that you're able to improvise and take any teacher you ever wanted to train with basically it's out there so you're you can try different approaches to technique to bar to coordination to anything so in that way it's 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 effective in learning for beginners it's a different story or for school kids it's a different story when their bodies are not experienced yet to do a full repertoire and, and a change teaching and change, uh, you know, school methods, um, then I think one-on-one classes are really effective because my first question when I connect on one-on-one asks, what do you need? What are your weaknesses? What do you want to work on? What are your problems? So then I want to hear what the dancer feels that they have lost during this time or, or they never felt, you know, it's thrown out, the footwork, extensions, strength in general, anything. So then I believe in one-on-one teaching. Unfortunately, we cannot touch, which is in Bali, as, as we all know, in Bali, we just to feel something, to turn now, to correct, to lift the back. So I think, but, I have come to understand that with the explanation and showing, actually, uh, students do understand. It's it, what I thought is a necessity to actually sometimes take the leg and turn out. Maybe it takes me five minutes longer to explain which muscle to connect and how and what to feel. And, and, and I ask students themselves to take the leg turn it out and feel it. So it just takes longer time. So I think that's what online comes to. It's more patience, it's more time, and definitely a lot, a lot being very, very um, 
detailed to really seeing everything. Um, but when it comes to a group class, this is a completely different thing, you know. When we do a worldwide ballet class or, or, or any other platform, it's me doing class and people are following that class. They want to join, they want to train, train along basically. So that's a, I don't call that really teaching. I call that I'm giving class, but that's not teaching. I can explain a few things to take care of while you do this and this exercise and what's the meaning and, and what's the thought behind but I, I cannot call that teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you been doing anything else to stay in shape during this time of self sequestration? Are you doing any cross training or walking? Um, walking at the beginning, it was hard because we were really in the lockdown <laughs> period of time. So it was just home and only one person can go to the store, nobody else from the household could leave. So it was very strict, at least here in Canada. Um, now everything has opened up. So I, I, I go to bike with my son to the ravine. But in terms of training, just before I do class, it's never just a class. I, I have structured my days into a warm up and gym one day, warm up Pilates another day, or warm up uh, and um, floor bar third day. So I, I change plus a two hour class plus some stretching, it becomes a good four and a half hours of training, at least, just to, just to feel that I'm active, <laughs> I know. But, uh, it's but it's not enough, it's, it's not the same, of course, as dancing, but uh, as I say, I, I, I really took time to, to reshaping the whole work at the bar, and trying to activate everything that I would do while dancing, you know, a, a longer exercises, repeat, this and that, just to try to, to feel strong, mm -hmm. yeah. not going down the hill. <laughs> Durant, what do you miss the most right now during this time? Stage, really? stage, 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 colleagues. We are, you know, we're so used to always going to the theater and seeing, you know, 70 people in the studio every, every day or more um, work with them, you know, every day. And I understand how I did take that for granted sometimes, right? It just, again, it feels normal when it's every day. But when this was suddenly so abruptly taken away, because my, let's say my performance had to be tomorrow, Romeo and Juliet, so I had to have my stage call today. And I warmed up, I did my class, I had the hair on and uh, ready for stage call, a uh, run through. And uh, then it was announced that we're closing down. So from that adrenaline of I'm having a performance tomorrow with all the company to going home, closing the doors and for basically three months not coming out of <laughs> home um, was a shock. So. I miss colleagues, real, real human experience, not virtual, <laughs> you know, a, a real talking, a real touch, a real everything. And, and, uh, and of course stage, because Bali for me, it's not training. We train, we do our class, you know, gym. I would do it anyway to feel active and in shape but I do it usually to go on stage and suddenly this is all I have. And for me, it does not have a purpose then because I don't think I would do ballet because this is not ballet. I, I don't think in general I, I would ever do ballet because I like the work at the bar at the middle and the center. I do ballet, all of this ritual is a warm up to get to the roles, <laughs> get to rehearsals and be on stage and live a different life, you know, and, uh, and be the character and, and that. And I realized one thing that everybody told me who have retired, let's say, older ballerinas, and it was, um, and it was hard to believe. I was like, what do you mean? When you're an, a normal human being, you can do so many things. But I realized by in this situation now that 
there is nothing that allows you to express yourself more than our profession. I mean, through music, through movement, through emotions, you can cry on stage, you can scream on stage, you can laugh, you can, it's really, it's that expression of who we are deep, deep inside that I feel truly only ballet can give you this opportunity to bring it out of you. And, uh, and I miss that. I, I really do. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully everybody will get back. Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh my goodness. I know. This has been such a strange time, really. For everyone. For everyone. Who would have ever thought? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, I'm not sure I have any more questions for you. <laughs> um, just because you've said so many interesting things. What else have they asked here? Um, is there anything you wish you had known when you were a young dancer that you know now? Yes, I do. Um, what is it? <laughs> I wish I would have learned to take a better care of myself when I was younger, because uh, when you're so hard on yourself and you're such a one is a, such a perfectionist, right? We, we go a long ways to reach our goals. And, uh, and even people told me, you know, you'll pay the price back, you'll pay the price back. I'm like, nah, I won't. But uh, at certain point in the career, and I hear it from a more mature ballerinas, and now, and now I know that I'm not alone. I think it's, it's, I wish the knowledge that kids have today, because they're, they're much more open to everything than I was in nineties, right? The world was much closer and I didn't get a lot of in, information did not even get to me. So I was improvising with that. And, uh, and I wish I would have gotten somehow from somewhere the information that I have now towards how to take care of your body, how to, how to not burn yourself, how to, how to actually love yourself. That's the biggest, that was the toughest thing because we always, and I, again, I don't think I'm the only one. We always think we're not good enough. Every performance is not good enough. Every day is not good enough. So of course it's motivating because I don't believe you, one can become so good at what they do and exceptional if they don't push themselves because there's nobody else to push you really nobody it's only you and yourself but the little things that one can learn that i learned throughout the life that's probably the only thing to learn how to take care of yourself and have the knowledge that students have today in schools uh, about their body and um and, and their relationship with their body. Um, so the students of today are actually very lucky and they should appreciate that. <laughs> wow. that's, I think that's the only thing. <laughs> Do you get back to Lithuania at all? Um, I'm trying to keep close ties and try to guess there a few times a year. And unfortunately during COVID, my swan leg got canceled this uh, spring and summer and uh, Giselle got canceled in autumn. So here you go, o already missed opportunities. But, uh, but I do keep close with the community and ballet community through the clothing line that I've created that has a foundation um, and a big mission behind to support the kids who are not uh, very fortunate financially, but are very, very talented. So the the profits of sales goes towards my foundation and I'm intended as soon as we have, you know, enough to start helping children to get out to the world, go to competitions, buy point shoes, tights, anything they need. So throughout that foundation, I have to say, I kept my doors uh, wide open and I communicate often and with the school and with the theater and with students and with dancers. So I'm trying to find the ways to keep the ties closed. That's, that's really close ties. Close ties, yes. 
That's really my Self ties. <laughs> my English. Self self taught. <laughs> no, I cannot believe that. Is that true? Yeah. 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 You did an excellent job. <laughs> That's amazing. I think English is not an easy language. We have, uh, I, I would hate to have to learn English. It's, <laughs> you know, some of the words are spelled differently, but they're pronounced the same. They have different meaning. I just think it's very confusing. I'm still learning. I'm yeah. still learning. I'm reading. And, and the more I read, the more I understand how much I have to learn still. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It sounds like you are, I think you've been a hard worker all your life. I'm, I don't know, I guess in my genetics, in my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Part of what you do. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add or say? I don't know. I just hope all of this is going to be over. And I think my biggest hope is all of this situation. Something has to, something good has to come up out of this. In arts, in culture. In, in the relationship towards each other as human beings, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of, you know, how, how important is actually socializing and, and, uh, and being human. So, but that's very, you know, wide and philosophical, but I, I do hope honestly and truly that this situation will bring something in all of us, in all the world, something good that we all can learn from. I hope so. I really do. Well, I really enjoyed talking with you. You're very inspiring. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, I it was will... lovely talking to you too. Oh, so sweet. And I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't really get to see your dog, but we heard your dog. <laughs> he went to sleep. Did he really? Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And take care. Good luck. I hope to see you one day somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you for interviewing me. Oh, it was welcome. really fun. Yeah, it was. Take care, Judith. Bye-bye. <laughs>